Well, Laura, this is a fantastic quarterly essay. You've done some great ones before. But this one about what Australia can learn from New Zealand really addresses, I think, one of the big blind spots in Australia, uh, particularly in our political discourse, which is we do not pay nearly enough attention to our neighbour, New Zealand, which we are closest to in every, in every conceivable mm. respect, history, demography, um, culture, um, but there are big differences. And I've always felt that in many ways, the New Zealanders do things much more efficiently and effectively than we do. And they seem to have a much more civilised political mm. environment. Yeah. So, congratulations. Well, thank you, Malcolm. That's, uh, that's really nice. Um, why, why is it the case, do you think, that we pay so little attention to them? Well, look, it's a real problem with, it's a problem with, I think, um, always looking to the great and powerful friend. You know, I mean, you nail it in the essay, you, you make the point that um, in the, you know, 100 years ago or more, uh, when the Australian Federation was being founded, uh, the Australian colonies and indeed New Zealand, the Australasian colonies, uh, looked more to London mm. than they did to each other. Mm. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, the, you know, that was the centre of the universe. And I think nowadays we then subsequently, uh, the round, you know, following the Second World War or during the Second World War, our focus was on Washington, mm -hmm. uh, but it was always looking somewhere else. Now, uh, you know, there is a world elsewhere, as Coriolana said, but it, it is important to remember that New Zealand is very close. And the thing that the thing that I used to sort of emphasise all, all, all my time in, in politics in Canberra was that all countries, particularly all developed countries, are basically addressing the same challenges, mm. Mm. you know, of, of, and they are, uh, you know, all of them, whether they're security challenges, social welfare challenges, education, health, and so forth. And, and they're all doing it in somewhat different ways. Uh, and say so we should pay more attention to what's happening because we can learn from other people's successes and or mistakes. Uh, and particularly when you're talking about jurisdictions that are similar. Mm. Um, and I, I found in Canberra the bureaucracy and the politicians generally were di only dimly aware of what the Australian states were doing, let alone what was happening in New Zealand. Mm. And New Zealand, they paid no attention to at all. And, and it is extraordinary when, I mean, when I was researching the essay that there are just so many instances where that they're having virtually the same discussion at virtually the same time, mm. whether it's on economic policy, foreign policy, indigenous affairs, and we're oblivious to it. Uh, yet there were, there were lessons both of us could learn. I mean, yeah. one thing that's interesting to me is that often um, New Zealand officials will say that they went and talked to state governments, but not necessarily to the yeah. federal government. And you can see why that would be given the different Yeah, structure. well, that's right, because yeah. New Zealand has no states uh, and the national government has the full range of governmental responsibilities, mm. whereas in Australia, in a federation, they're split between Canberra and the mm. states. So, yeah, I, I can absolutely see that. I mean, I, I was very interested to see the way they handle broadband, and I wrote a bit about that mm. in my own book, A Bigger Picture. Mm. Um, you know, they, they, they had a very business-like, pragmatic approach to broadband and got a, an outcome that is, you could say it's just as good or better, it's certainly not worse, uh, at a fraction of the cost that we spend. But was that partly driven by the fact that there wasn't such a sort of complex mess of politics and standoffs with their telecommunications carrier that we had in in that first decade of the century with Telstra. Yeah, I, well, I think that, might, that that was the history was different, right? But the but the interesting thing was that what they recognised was that if if you're going to have a national broadband wholesaler utility, then it makes sense to start off with the national carrier, Telecom New Zealand, their equivalent of, of Telstra, and split it. Mm. And they did it in a very clever way. That means you now have a, a privately, a, a publicly owned, publicly listed company called Chorus, which is the independent, effectively the NBN, 
and the, the rest of the Telecom Museum is called Spark, and that's the retail. And that was a much better outcome. Now, we, that's what we should have done after we got, we being the coalition, got in in 2013. I tried to get that deal done with uh, Telstra, but um, to sort of, in effect, back solve it. Uh, but they reckon they'd got such a lucrative deal from the Labor Party, they wouldn't give it up. You know, they're basically saying, well, you know, these mugs and the Labor Party gave us such an enormous amount of money. Why, not well, why, why would we do a rational deal with you? In fact, the history of privatisation and corporatisation in New Zealand going back earlier than that, you'd have to say, was, to be polite, a much more mixed one. I think that's right. And I think a lot of the Roger Douglas economic reforms that you describe in your book, and, and I hear it, see it's been described as a thriller somewhere, but it is thrilling. You write magnificently. Uh, and it is, um, it, you know, that the drama of that and the fact that they did it with, with really with no public mandate. I mean, it actually, in a way, New Zealand is admirable. This is why you, you can learn you can learn both the good things and the bad things. One of the interesting things, I thought, from reading your essay was that it's a reminder of the benefits of checks and balances. You know, the, in New Zealand, if you are the government and you command a majority in the House of Representatives, you can pretty much do what you like. Whereas in Australia, of course, it's, it's only the beginning because you've going to, to deal with the Senate and then you've got states and the Constitution. It's, uh, it's quite complex. Um, and they introduced those sweeping economic reforms uh, to basically take a heavily protected uh, economy and throw it open to the chill blast of competition. This is the Labor government that did that with, with um, really no public mandate at all. And, and, you know, then the Conservatives, the National Party got in and again, as you describe, uh, undertook uh, dramatic cost-cutting uh, in order to address budgetary challenges, again without a mandate. So no wonder the public were tearing their hair out and voted for MMP, yeah. um, which is probably, which is complex. Uh, and to me, one of the interesting things was MMP in Australia was always sort of seen as this oh, it's this terrible block on reform. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, you know, as I say in the essay, it, it was really you know, cause and effect. It mm. came about by accident, um, because David Longy hadn't read, read the uh, papers properly, uh, because people were so disillusioned with the major parties. Mm -hmm. And the effect of that uh, was, you know, obviously really significant. I don't think it necessarily has blocked reform, but it has created some sort of checks and balances. And I think it's, it's an interesting reflection back on the way we see our system, because everybody says, oh, the Senate, oh, the states, and obviously it's complicated. But you know, there is something to be said for having not just checks and balances, but for having a debate about what you're doing, which there, which there just wasn't during the 80s and 90s in New Zealand at all. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. No, I, I think that's exactly right. Mm. But I think <clears throat> one of the other interesting things that comes out of your essay is that New Zealand has not had the crazy culture wars we've had. Mm. And I think you... You, you, your contention is that that is in part because Murdoch doesn't have a large share of the media. In fact, there's virtually no media in New Zealand. Uh, and I agree with that. I mean, so many New Zealanders have said to me, we could not have the type of society we do if we had Murdoch here. Um, and you can imagine if you had a whole lot of, you know, if you had the Murdoch press in New Zealand whipping up racism, whipping up antagonism, you know, between uh, Pakaha and Maori, you mm. know, it'd be, you, you would, you know, you can imagine it could, it could be quite a different place. Yeah. And there were points of time when that you could sort of see clear examples of that. For example, we had the race mm. riots at Cronulla mm. in 2005, mm. Mm. and at about the same time, Don Brash, the then national mm. leader, started to sort of whip up uh, sentiment against uh, settlements under the Treaty of Waitangi. And for a short period of time, he got a boost in the polls, but ultimately he just didn't get the momentum that he would have got if there was sort of sort of that sort of uh, phalanx of media uh, commentators and supporters all coming out backing him along the way. Um, so, I mean, once again, it's, a, it's such an interesting case study for us in sort of being able to take an element out of our political debate 
and say, well, what does it look like otherwise? Mm. And I think, you, you mean, you talked earlier on about the fact that New Zealand has more civilised discussion. Um, now, to what extent do you think that's a result of MMP or do you think it's just because they're more civilised people? I, I think it is. I think MMP is possibly part of it, but I think part of it is because they, their media scene is, um, is not crazy, as crazy as, as it is here. And there is a much, uh, there seems to be a much more uh, bipartisan commitment to, um, uh, you know, dealing rationally and objectively with, uh, you know, racial and, and cultural issues. I mean, look, I think, it, look, to be fair, I think Australia, I always say Australia is the most successful multicultural society in the world, and we are much more diverse than New Zealand. Mm. I, mean, I said earlier we have demography in common, that's true up to a point. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are much more diverse. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there are and have been for a very long time uh, people trying to, you know, tear the fabric of our society mm -hmm. apart mm -hmm. on the basis of uh, ethnicity and race and, and uh, so forth, religion. Um, and that's why it's so important for leaders to do everything they can to keep enforcing the obligation of mutual respect. Mm. But we made different decisions. I mean, we, we, we dealt with uh, Mabo and Wick, and then it all sort of fell into abeyance. Do you think that's a really... Well, I don't know that it's fallen into abeyance. I mean, I think the whole land, um, you know, land titles and land claims have been, you know, being, have been dealt with, mm. and are being, you know, they're mostly now resolved, is my understanding. Um, when I was PM, I was, Present when at the you know final resolution of the uh, Kenby land claim, which was a big uh, with involving the Larrakia people, you know, in the Darwin area, mm. um, and um, you know that was a very you know historic land claim, quite, quite a complex one. You know, it involved both um, uh, you know land owned in community uh, and uh, and also freehold land. It was quite a, it was a you know. For, it was a, still a contentious deal because some people feel they didn't get a fair deal out of it. But you've got to have a process, and it's not necessarily going to make everyone happy. But the difference was that uh, what happened with uh, the Treaty of Waitangi Tribunal was it did lead to this process of truth telling, mm. reconciliation, uh, because there are other elements, of course, in the mm. treaty itself um, the recognition of language. New Zealand is now a bi officially bilingual. Uh, we didn't go to those aspects of reconciliation? No, it's, a, it's I mean, obviously, it's, di you know, it's different. Mm. Um, the Maori uh, had one, one language, language, right? And uh, the, and were not, while they were Maori living all over New Zealand, there's, there weren't many in the South Island, mm. it was mostly in the North, North Island, so it was a more concentrated community, and they all, all had a common uh, sort of origin story, uh, which is which was true, mm -hmm. you know, of arriving from um, you know Polynesia in uh, I think it was Polynesia in uh, canoes, and you know they had different different um, stories about I think depending on which canoe you came in. So right, it's uh, certainly there's a um, there's that 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 is a I guess a more Cohe cohesive, cohesive story. story. I mean the um, but having said that, uh, the richness and diversity of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander culture in Australia is something that I think people are now much more aware of than they used to be. Uh, and, you know, I like to think I did my uh, a small part in that. I was the first person, I believe, in the House of Representatives, and certainly the first Prime Minister, to speak in language in the Ngunnawal language uh, and I, that, that act in and of itself as well as support we gave to IATSIS I think has helped um, promote the, um, what was already a movement for um, you know, the recovery, the learning, uh, the instruction in Aboriginal languages of which you know, there, were, there were 300, I think it's 360 roughly distinct Aboriginal languages in Australia, um, as different from each other as, you know, Hungarian is from French. And so, 
it's very, very complex, uh, uh, you know, cultural environment, and all the more important that we do everything we can to, uh, uh, you know, support uh, First Australians as they, you know, recover and uh, and you know and, and recover that cultural history, and also <laughs> go on to develop it because you know. You know, indigenous culture is not an artifact. It's, uh, it's a living thing. It's a living thing, yeah. Well, I, I, I argue in the essay that um, what's happened in New Zealand sort of draws us sort of inexorably towards the Uluru Statement from the yeah. heart. Now, obvious, you know, the obvious contentious issue about that is the voice, yeah. um, the voice to Parliament or government, and we'll come back to that. But that point about the fact that it is also about truth-telling, reconciliation, the idea of a makarata, of a treaty, mm. they're the sort of overlooked aspects of that statement mm. from the heart. Mm. Do you regret that, that those aspects of the statement from the heart sort of got tossed out? Well, they, the were, they weren't tossed out. I mean, the, 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 the statement from the heart is a beautiful evocative piece of poetry but you know the re the referendum advisory council which produced it uh, was meant to actually give parliament some government and opposition because of bipartisan thing some recommendations as to what we should do you know the idea originally was it was going to say well change this you know delete that section replace this these words um, so we got that, and then basically um, the uh, message was, well, there it is, uh, the, you know, the details up to others and people, everyone had a different view as to what it meant. It was like grappling with a column of smoke. And honestly, the, the Referendum Advisory Council was a terrible failure of leadership on the part of the council, because what they should have done was come up with something that was actionable. And they didn't, and that was because because what um, uh, was being proposed with the voice, as far as one could understand it, was uh, a um, you know a national um, nationally elected uh, chamber or council of only composed of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, only elected by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people which would be consulted, which the constitution would require, had to, the parliament had to consult on, on any matters that affected Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now, you know, that, that is, I mean, I was criticised for saying that that would amount to a third chamber of parliament, but I don't resolve from that at all. I mean, if you say, you know, from a political point of view, every, every law affects Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It affects, it affects, you know, Christians, Jews, Muslims, you know, people of every ethnicity. It affects all Australians. And so where do you, how do you draw the line? How is it, you know, how is it going to operate? What about, how's, you know, how's, what's the, how's it going to interact with the legislative program of the parliament? What if the parliament, government needs to pass a bill as it occasionally does through both houses in a couple of days? Mm. Uh, and, and none of this was even remotely addressed by the uh, Referendum Advisory Council. See, what, what had happened was the recognition agenda had been going down one track for a long time, and that was to remove outdated, you know, racist language from the Constitution, insert language that acknowledged First Nations people appropriately and also provided and this was, was some debate about this, that the federal parliament's power to legislate with respect to uh, indigenous Australians could only be used for their advancement. There was, you know, there was questions as to whether that was appropriate or necessary, but that was, it was essentially a traditional constitutional amendment thing. The Uluru Statement literally took a sidestep and went in a different direction. And then, but it was so lacking in particularity, in detail, that it really wasn't effectively actionable. It was essentially an expression of, uh, it wasn't a plan, you know, and that's, and I mean, that's the difference, you see, with 
with Waitangi, you actually had an agreement. I mean, and that's, I mean, and that's, so I think you need to get down to tin tax and reach agreements, you can call them treaties if you like, but, um, and there have been a number reached in Australia. At a national level, um, a treaty at a national level, I think the question is what would you put, what could you put in it? What would it say other than pretty broad generalities? If you like, if you look at the settlement in Western Australia with the Noongar people, that is, you know, that is quite particular. It deals with this bit of land, those rights, you know, all of those particular things. Um, I, I, I think probably the best way to approach it is to work from the bottom up, work from practical things that people can agree on, uh, and then see how that emerges into some kind of national statement. Because the difficulty with gener generally worded statements uh, is that people on the ground in communities, you know, whether they're you know, indigenous or non-indigenous, will tend to look at that and say that are, that they are classically warm political words. But you know, what about where's the, where's the you where's know, where's the detail for sure. me? Well, well, two things out of that. I mean, one of the things that comes out of New Zealand is the importance of structures and institutions mm -hmm. for Maori yeah. uh, in being able to develop their voice, not, yeah. not necessarily a voice mm -hmm. department. That's been things like the fact that they did have those four seats reserved for Maori from early on, mm -hmm. uh, but also the Maori Council, which be became a vehicle for, by which uh, Maori could start to sort of formulate what it was they actually wanted themselves. Because often it's the case that, as you know, there's a whole range of different issues, in, yeah. and particularly in Australia, with diff mm -hmm. different uh, structures that people want. So w I, I, I accept what you say about it being a very generalised statement, but wasn't there a role, if there'd been a failure of leadership, at the referendum yeah. council level, mm -hmm. as you say, for political leadership to have then taken that on and said, well, look, this, there are these problems with this. Mm -hmm. um, the two questions we need to resolve are, one, some institutions mm -hmm. to try to make, to make something more specific out of this, and to also say, do we need a treaty? Do we need a national treaty? Rather than thinking about it in terms of a voice to parliament, well, which seems know. so contentious. Yeah, well, I don't know whether we, I don't know whether we do I mean, I, I, when I travelled around as Prime Minister uh, visiting Indigenous communities, and I don't you know, claim to have spent enough time with them to be you know, remotely expert or authoritative, uh, but uh, people invariably were raising more local issues. Uh, when people, Indigenous people, Indigenous Australians complained about or talked about the demise of ATSIC, for example, they uh, talked about that, that what they lamented was not the peak body, uh, which would have been the equivalent of the voice to parliament, but rather the, the regional, regional councils. councils. And that, that, that was very consistent. And so the empowered communities agenda is one way of addressing that. And I mean, you know, Noel Pearson's, that was originally a concept, you know, concept of his Cape York Institute. Um, I think the, the range of, uh, well, I, I, I think that's the, that, that that's probably where you've got to where you've got to start. Uh, you know, I think the, the it's it's a question as as I used to say again when I was prime minister a lot. We have to but be you know doing less uh, to Aboriginal uh, you know and Torres Strait Islander people and more with them. We've got to be working with people. In fact, we shouldn't be doing anything to uh, First Australians at all. It should be always collaborative and cooperative. And uh, so, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's, that's got to be the key. Um, there is a, there's a, a, a tendency, you know, the, uh, there's a tendency to be looking for the big, great sweeping gesture that can, you know, resolve all of these problems, can, you know, wipe the slate of, ignominious history clean and, and move on. I don't think that's possible. And I think you, you've got to get, uh, you know, you just need greater collaboration and very, and, and recognise 
that the experience of Indigenous Australians is incredibly diverse. The largest community of First Nations Australians or First Australians live in Western Sydney and they live, uh, you know, the vast bulk of them in circumstances not materially different not to their, you know, non-Indigenous neighbours. Uh, then you, um, you know, you go from there to the terrible social problems in Tennant Ten Creek in, in the Northern Territory. You know, they're calling out for very different responses. And I think the important thing is to, that's why I say I think the important thing is to focus on the, on getting greater empowerment, engagement uh, at a local level. And we're not really but, having... But, but I, the other point I mm, make, just yes. is the big, the big picture, back to the title of my book, uh, the big picture, bigger not picture. the big picture, the bigger picture uh, is uh, that as a Republican with a small R, I do not believe that we should in our constitution accord uh, sort of civic rights to people other than in their capacity as Australian citizens. So I do not I'm not a fan of identity politics and of any kind, but I think the important thing, do, do I think there should be more Indigenous Australians in the Parliament? Absolutely. And, and, and there are a lot more than there used to be, of course, and I hope there'll be more in the future. But do I think we should set up in the Constitution special constitutional rights for Indigenous Australians? Uh, no. I don't, I'd actually, I really, I think that's a bad idea. So. And that's not that. That's because I'm committed to the equality of all Australians. I think the highest political honour in this country is Australian citizen. The bigger the bigger complexities. We're getting way off New Zealand now. We must well, no, 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 because it's <laughs> all driven by this. Across the ditch. We will go back across the ditch. But, but the bigger complexities of yeah. this are, you know, uh, that nobody's really debating. Sort of things like regional councils and things like this. So the likelihood that we're going to get any progress on what's loosely referred to as constitutional recognition or whatever is pretty unlikely in the short term. Oh, oh, I think I, I think absolutely the constitution is almost impossible to change, mm -hmm. remember, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, you know, George Winterton wasn't kidding when he uh, uh, described, uh, you know, in a book on constitutional law, his title was The Frozen Continent. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it is. And New Zealand has the benefit of a, a, a constitutional act which the parliament can change at yeah, any time. Yes. As, do, as do well, as with some degrees of difficulty, yeah. so can the states. Sure. Know. So, well, let's let's go back to comparisons. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, as you've said, people envy the fact that it's you know you can sort of almost do anything uh, in New Zealand. Um, how's your view about how MMP has played out in New Zealand? Well, I think I think it was obviously initially people were horrified by it and saying, good grief, why have we done this? You know, that's meant we've had to work with all sorts of minor parties. And, you know, there's a degree of, there is a sort of a disconnect. In, among the major parties, uh, there is always a sort of collective disbelief and dismay that uh, voters will actually vote for independents and smaller parties. And you know, how to could they? How could they? <laughs> what, what are these people thinking? Don't they realise that you know we, the political establishment, are much better at running the show? Uh, I think there is a uh, people instinctively want to see more diversity, uh, and they're obviously sceptical about the power structures in the major parties and how representative they are. And I think they're, they've got every reason to be sceptical about that. And so I, I, I think the. That forcing people to collaborate more is actually a good idea. I mean, this is where the Senate, for all of its frustrations, and believe me, you know, I've had plenty of times when, and I've been, you know, racking my brains to work out how to get things through the Senate, but, you know, when governments have had control of the Senate, they've often tended to overreach. I mean, John Howard did in his last term, without any doubt. I mean, you know, uh, what, work, what? work choices yeah. was. John did not have a mandate for work choices. That's the truth, and and that was hubris, uh, which um, was, you know, came back to you know to bite him. Uh, but I think you know having to work with a crossbench is not a bad idea. Now I reformed the voting rules for the Senate 
to get around this absurdity of, you know, of all of those, um, you know, preference whisperers and, you know, the way in which you had all those group voting tickets and, you know, you got people that got a thousand primary votes suddenly ended up in the Senate. So now it's a much more straightforward thing and, you know, people can see who they've allocated their preferences to. But if they want to put in a Green or an Independent or, you know, uh, even someone less... Uh, you know, edifying than that. That's their democratic right. But ha have, have our major parties, do you think, become worse at actually going, well, we've got to negotiate with a crossbench and we've just got to learn to do it? Oh, I mean, I because, we, I mean, we, we were very, we were, well, I was PM, I can tell you. We, I mean, well, okay, when, when, when we won in oath in 13, uh, Abbott was very impatient with the crossbench in the Senate. And bizarrely, he insisted at the outset that Erica Betts would conduct all the negotiations. Now, I mean, Eric's, whatever talents Eric has got, you know, his charm and, you know, persuasive skills are not among them, right? So that didn't work very well. I took a very different approach. Um, and uh, Matthias Cormann was very effective as a Senate whisperer, as indeed were all of the leadership group, as was George Brandis before it. So, you know, we really, we got a lot of things through. We got, as you would remember as a journalist, there are a lot of things that we were told we couldn't, by the gallery, we couldn't get through the Senate that we did. I, I look, I think that's what politics is all about. It's all about compromise and negotiation. And, you know, so, I mean, it, it's, you know, there's no doubt that, um, you know, the benign, all wise dictator, perhaps can run the country more efficiently, but such godlike creatures do not exist. And even if they look benign at <laughs> the outset, they tend to become very different. Not so much. Yeah. So, so I, think, I, think, I think requiring more collaboration uh, is a good thing. Um, you know, I, again, I, I, I don't know that... I, think, I don't think we'd ever need to do MMP here because we've got the Senate, mm. you know. Well, one really interesting observation to me that Helen Clark made was yeah. she said, look, the way the system works in New Zealand is it forces the major parties into the centre. You can only win in the centre. Uh, and MMP has emphasised that. She said, you're not competing for mm -hmm. the votes of the outlying parties because they can all get in on their own right. But in Australia, because of the preferential voting system, it's dragging the major parties out from the centre because mm -hmm. they're relying on those uh, on those minor party yeah. votes. What do you think of that yeah, I analysis? Think this, I think there's, when you first um, quoted that, I, I initially thought that's not right. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is some truth in it. Um, I think it's a fair comment, in other words. I think the, the fact that we have compulsory voting means that our politics broadly is conducted in the centre. The problem with voluntary voting, as you have in the US, is that your big challenge is getting the vote out. So the Republicans run off to the right to get their base out, and the Democrats run off to the left to get theirs out. So when everyone votes, the debate is more in the centre. But I do see this issue in terms of preferences, particularly in Queensland with the coalition. The LNP increasingly has been more anxious about one nation than it's been about the Labor Party. They're worried about one nation stealing their branch members and supporters and so you'll get LNP members and the LNP generally steering off to the right to try to head off one nation and you know my point to them has always been uh, you cannot outdo Pauline Hanson on the right because she you know she, she, she is if you're prepared to go you know toe to toe with her you will be out in the far right saying the most appalling intolerant uh, things that will then alienate uh, the middle ground. And, and, you know, you have, you know, to be honest, um, Anastasia Palaszczuk's two last election wins have been, I think, in large part because the LNP could not retain the support of the middle ground in South East Queensland, which, by the way, is where most people in Queensland live. So I think Helen's, Helen makes a fair point. So essentially, the lesson from New Zealand and from Helen Clark in a way, and from Queensland most recently, is that, mm -hmm. that both the LNP and Labor should actually be heading back to the centre rather than out 
Well, I think they always should. should. I mean, mm. you know, the point I've made recently, I wrote a piece about it in The Guardian recently, I mean, the on the climate issue, you know, uh, Morrison is obviously, you know, anxious that if he moves too far to into rational territory on climate, that he'll, the right will blow up on him as they did on me. Um, but, you know, they're, they're, that whatever you think about, I mean, that's clearly the wrong thing to do from a policy point of view, but leave, just looking at it, in a crass political way, you know, we now, we now have three roll gold safe liberal electorates that are held by small L liberal progressive women uh, who won, won it from the Liberal Party, uh, held it from the Liberal Party, which is seen as being far too blokey uh, and far too conservative. And of course, we had a fourth, my old seat, Wentworth, was held uh, by Karen Phelps, and the uh, and, you know, I think you could see more uh, urban seats going that way, you know, where you've got people, candidate, independent candidates who are, if you like, um, rational or, you know, centre-right on economics, uh, and, uh, but progressive on social issues and in particular on climate. So, so there's a, so, you know, there's a real risk in, in a parliament and a House of Representatives with only 151 seats. You can't afford to have your safe seats peeling off to the cross bench because not only does that makes it harder for you to get to you know 76, but it also means that you end up spending millions of dollars trying to win seats back from independence. Seats like you know yeah. Baringa and, and Indi and Mayo or Wentworth, where historically for the most part the parties have spent very little money because they've been safe seats. Mm -hmm. You describe John Key as a friend and role model and mm. note that he achieved lower taxes and managed to grow the economy faster than outlays. Yep. I'd like to just go back over, back to the history of economic reform in New Zealand mm. and Australia in the period mm. in the SA. Mm. Which country was more successful? Well, um, that's a good question. I think really I would have thought, um, in, you know, I would have thought in many respects New Zealand, but having read your essay, I think you've got to say it was Australia, but I suspect if John Key had, I don't know if you've spoken to John, but John might say, well, yes, but you know, you guys had the enormous bonanza of the minerals export boom. We did, and, we did later, but in the yeah. 80s and 90s, they went in hard and fast because mm. Roger Douglas thought, well, yeah. we'll do this and we'll lose and yeah. we've got to do yeah. all one, one two. Yeah. But it was at a huge, Huge cost. Huge, huge cost. Yeah, I think it, I think I think Australia did it better. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I mean, one I, one of the things I always liked about New Zealand, for example, and their tax system was they don't ha they ha they tax you or your income from dollar one. Now, so that means they have lower margin. They have lower rates. The 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 the, the you know tax rates are lower. Uh, but your average tax is broadly the same, which is really what matters. See, from an incentive point of view, it's better that people, if they're looking to work, you know, do some extra, you know, time or overtime or, you know, grow a business or whatever, it's better if they're looking to paying tax at, you know, 35% rather than 45%, obviously, because I'll keep more of the money in their pocket. But equally, uh, you've got to you know, protect the revenue. Now, what, one of the problems we've got, and there's a number of reasons for this, historical reasons for this, uh, is a very high tax-free threshold. The problem with the tax-free threshold is that it, it benefits everybody, whether you're earning $30,000 a year or $3 million a year. And so, the, um, I think the, the and, you know, one of the things I looked at as Prime Minister, again I described this in my book, was if we could get back to a taxing from dollar one basis, but it's hugely, it, it literally is, is, is so difficult. And the, and you know, so the Kiwis, I think, pulled the right rein a long time ago, just as they did with GST, by the way. I mean, GST should be on everything. They you also, know? they didn't pull quite such a right rein on capital gains tax. But well, they haven't got one. Yeah, I know, I know, oh. and that's a, that's, uh, that is, that's and, a and in fact, apart from the tax-free threshold, which is always quite hard to say. It is, I'm glad you struggle with it. <laughs> um, but that's reassuring. Then, of course, uh, 
uh, John Howard sort of doubled up on that by, you know, sort of the way he structured the scales made it so expensive to actually cut tax rates. Yeah. But I mean, while, while it's true, uh, you say that, um, you know, Key is your friend, um, when he was in government, lowered taxes, he actually increased the rate of GST and New Zealand had a recession after mm. the GFC. So yeah. it's, it, it, I mean, I find the yeah. coalition uh, holding New Zealand's response to the GFC up against Australia's uh, a little bit disingenuous. Well, yeah, yes, yes, but, but well, it's not disingenuous it's, it, at all. I mean, you know, the thing that, that rescued us from the GFC was the Chinese stimulus, not the Australian one. And yeah, if, I, if, I mean, if you I mean, accept that argument, that's what also ultimately rescued New Zealand. Uh, yeah, but not to the same extent. I mean, they, they are, I mean, John, uh, John, John and I would often talk about how I thought New Zealand did things more efficiently than us. And there's a whole lot of areas of regulation and so forth, and I think they do better too, which are probably too technical. But mm. John would say, he would say, yeah, yeah, well, that's, he'd say, he'd accept the compliment, and then he'd say, well, he said, of course, we haven't had all that money to throw around. He said, you know, we've, we've always had to, you know, work out how to do things economically because we've been, we haven't had the funds. Mm. That's true. But do you think New Zealand paid too high a price in terms of uh, social disruption and greater inequality for the Red Bull? Well, I think, I think you make the case. I mean, I had not, to be honest, until I'd read your quarterly essay, I hadn't really focused on the history of it. I mean, I think that's... What I think is great about this essay of yours is that it is, in, in many respects, it's, it is a comparative history. And it's written, you know, very eloquently, uh, but also and engagingly. But, I mean, wages are certainly lower in New Zealand. Uh, standard of living is lower uh, in, um, you know, generally. But, I mean, and a lot of Kiwis would say, you know, that, you know, they're living in, you know, smaller cities and, you know, living in, they can live a more, uh, they've got a better lifestyle, yeah. a lot of Kiwis would argue. Yeah. And, of course, one of the really interesting issues for New Zealand economic managers, if you like, is the fact that we're so close. So, you know, if, if, if Kiwis don't like what's going on in New Zealand, no. they can come here. We you know, the economies are, have been very integrated. And so, so New Zealanders have got the ability to come and work here and live here, although, you know, they're obviously issues about their social welfare entitlements and so forth, which have been a bit of a vexed issue. Uh, and speaking of relative, I mean, inequality is a massive political issue in New Zealand, partly because of yeah. you know, the history of reforms. Mm. Yet by a lot of measures, it is as great in Australia, but we don't seem to think it's, it's a problem. Why do you think that is? Well, um, we, we have obviously, uh, we have less inequality here uh, in terms of disposable income than a lot of other countries. I'm not sure about New Zealand, I take what you say, but certain, one of the reasons is that we have a highly means-tested welfare system. There's, a, you know, there's much, there's, we always complain about middle-class welfare, but there's a lot less of it here than there is in many other countries, including the US. Um, uh, look, I, I, I think the one lesson that comes out of this pandemic is that you have to make sure that communities are not left behind as a consequence of economic change and globalization and you know technological changes and so forth. Um, you know, I mean, Joe Biden's one of his key priorities has got to be, I think, to ensure that there is no longer a rust belt. You know, because that's that that is what is fueling, I think, the biggest threat to democracies, which is this right-wing authoritarian populism, which is basically getting uh, the support from working class people whose, and, and middle class people whose incomes have either vanished or flatlined or declined because they see it as because of the consequences of, you know, technological change and globalisation and so forth. So, you've, so that is, uh, so that, that's got to be a key priority. So, you know, in, a, in the Australian context, you know, I really regret the way people are still fighting this crazy culture war about coal, coal mining. And I mean, you know, obviously the Murdoch press are just into that, you know, at 100 miles an hour. And the, you know, right wing of 
my party, the Liberal Party, and the Nationals are into it. But you know, the truth is, coal is on the way up, right? And it has to be on the way up. Otherwise, the planet will become, in due course, uninhabitable. Uh, so we've got to stop burning coal. But what we have to do is start working on the plans to ensure that regions that depend on coal uh, have got a, you know, a prosperous future. Yeah. And hence, you know, why I applaud Matt Keane and uh, the Energy Minister and Gladys Berejiklian, and the Premier here in New South Wales, making the Hunter Valley a renewable energy zone. I think that's, and I, you know, I got some work started on that when I was PM, in fact. But it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities there, but that's what we've got to do, because otherwise, you you know, you'll end up not only with a lot of inequity and, and, uh, and poverty, frankly, uh, but you also start sowing the seeds for that, uh, that sort of uh, da dangerous populism that propelled Donald Trump to the White House. And, you know, don't think, don't, you know, Trump is a pretty, is a pretty remarkable, charismatic communicator, uh, but don't imagine that there aren't other people that can exploit those sentiments. I mean, you know, Hanson in her own way uh, exploits that kind of... Uh, uh, sentiment in the community. Sure. Well, finally, let's just talk about foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, New Zealand has taken another very divergent path on foreign policy in the last 40 years. What was your view at the time of New Zealand's decision to go it alone uh, at the time of the split with uh, the ANZUS alliance? Well, I thought it was unwise and unwelcome, but it was, you know, the, the anti-nuclear movement was very, very strong in New Zealand. And uh, the French attack on the uh, Rainbow Warrior in uh, the harbour in, in New Zealand. Uh, I mean, New Zealanders, you know, which was essentially uh, a response to New Zealand-based protests against nuclear testing. I mean, the anti-nuclear agenda was much bigger in New Zealand than it was here, and so the government's Labor government was responding to that. Mm. Uh, but it's really, I mean, it's interesting when you actually go and look at it, the extent to which the foreign policy has evolved as a result of that. I mean, New Zealanders are very proud of mm. seeing themselves as you know, independent mm. uh, and as, as multilateralists. Much, you know, it's, it's a very different self-perception to the one that Australians have. Yeah, I, well, I, I think the, the anti-globalist, anti-multilateralist uh, view of the world, which you know, Scott Morrison was channeling for about three months after he'd come back from visiting Trump, I think. But he, that, that is so manifestly contrary to our national interest. You know, it is, I'm really glad we don't hear any more of that. I mean, smaller powers, middle powers, whether it's New Zealand or Australia, have got a massive interest in the international rule of law and in multilateralism and in, you know, or international organisations and we should be in them and active in them and the Kiwis have always boxed well above their weight and good on them for doing so. I think Australia has, more or less, uh, but they're, they're absolutely right on that score. Where they have been uh, pretty pragmatic, I have to say, that's a generous like word, is in respect to the issues relating to China. Uh, they have been very reluctant to say anything about the South China Sea. They've been very reluctant. You know, they just, they just, that they, 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 they. So it is a trade relationship. They do not want to put their head above the parapet uh, on those issues if they can possibly avoid it, and 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 that is, and that is as that is as true, if not more true, of John Key as it is of uh, Jacinda Ardern. And so this is this is quite. Bipartisan. I mean, this, they were, you could say, you know, that their approach is think of the milk powder exports. That's right. But it, Australia was starting to get quite alarmed at one point that they were so, shall we say, pragmatic about mm, that, yeah. weren't they? Um, you know, within the Five Eyes arrangements and everything else, there was sort of pressure from Australia to sort of say, hey guys, you've got to start thinking a bit more strategically about yeah, this. Yeah, sure. And, and, they, and they've got, yeah, they have to. I think that's... I think that's right, but you know they don't want to get picked off. And, that, and that, you know, by the way, that is why it's very important that Australia, in you know, when we're facing the current pressures, uh, does not flinch. And it's very important that other, our, you know, friends and allies 
support us because, you know, what bullies seek to do, and, it's, and Beijing has no monopoly in this, is obviously to pick people off one at a time. So. so it was interesting to see Jacinda Ardern's intervention last week about the tweet. I mean, yeah, the, yeah, I thought that was good. I, thought, I mean, Jacinda Ardern, you know, is, is really one of the most interesting political leaders in our times. Um, she, when she became Prime Minister, she had been opposition leader for six weeks or something. She'd never been in government. Uh, she had, you know, very little experience. I, and I, you know, I was PM when she was elected and, you know, we, we worked together very effectively. But you could, you know, she managed a, a near vertical learning curve so well. You know, the sort of every time I spoke to her, you could see she absorbed more and, under, you know, she was, li and she listened to, you know, she's very strong personality, by the way, you know, and, and you know, not afraid of um, giving other people, including other leaders, you know, her, the benefit of her opinions, strongly held opinions, and that's good. But she also listens, and I, I think she's, I, 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 I just, I've been found it fascinating to just watch the way she's, she's evolved, because unlike for example, me or John Key, she didn't come into politics with a whole, you know, career and business life and so forth before it, you know, because she was A, she was much younger, and B, she had really only been, had political jobs before. So, uh, this is interesting, what, I mean, different political leaders have, a, have different skill sets. Some yeah. of them have sort of that absolutely native gut instinct for politics. You know, mm. and I don't mean necessarily populist politics, yeah, yeah. but that's their structure. Mm. Or they're policy nerds, or some mm. combination of both. Mm. You know, what, how, how, how would you characterise where you think she fits I, I in? Think her, I think, well, uh, I, I think she, well, she is highly intelligent in a conventional, you know, sense. Very, very, very smart. She's very eloquent, but I think her standout asset is emotional intelligence. You saw that in the uh, aftermath of the Christchurch massacre, but she has got a, she's, she's got a natural uh, charismatic warmth about her that is not faked. You know, it is not, um, you know, politicians all try to appear to be cuddly and lovely and so forth, and many of them do. Um, you know, if you are, uh, but she's, you know, the public can s smell inauthentic, you know, inauthentic fakes. fakes, yeah. And I, you know, I've got, you know, I think this is one of Shorten's problems, for example, you know, I mean, Shorten uh, was not able, in my observation, to speak on anything when he was leader, when I was, you know, his, I know he was my rival, I guess. Uh, he couldn't speak on things with conviction, and I couldn't under. You know, and the, you know, the sort of simplistic answer to say, "Oh well, he's a man of no convictions." Well, that's not that can't that's not true. It was that he was trying so hard to be something else, and you know, at some point, you, you really, if you can just be yourself, uh, and yourself is actually a warm, engaging, empathetic person, you're doing well. Of course. If just being yourself means you're going to be scratchy and unpleasant and selfish and brutish, then maybe you should think of another line of work. But the but so she's got the advantage that I think she is she's relaxed and uh, is is herself. She's no different privately than publicly, you know. Whereas I mean Julia Gillard, for example, one of the most uh, articulate engaging people in conversation when she got up to give a speech it was with one or two exceptions the misogyny speech being the great standard it was pretty wooden wouldn't you agree and so you know i think it was the, different it was different but you know this is the this is the point i mean so i think jacinda's that that emotional intelligence and that uh genuine sort of charismatic warmth which is a very authentic is what is really very, you know, really very engaging. So it's going to be interesting to see how she goes now. She's got a majority in her own right. Yeah, well, I mean, ultimately, she's going to, you know, she's going to have to deliver, dare I say, jobs and growth. Uh, 
<laughs> and houses. Uh, houses, yeah. Well, that's right. And I mean, this is the this is the thing. I mean, she's been lucky uh, to some extent that her opposition have been imploding, you know. And uh, you know, you, you can be very lucky with your opponent. I mean, just as Boris was in the UK with uh, Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, completely utterly unelectable. And uh, and you see Corbyn, see that's a very interesting example because I think the reason Corbyn did well in the election against uh, Theresa May was because nobody thought he could possibly win. And so it was in a sense a protest vote. It's a bit like the, um, the person who would be appalled by 90% of the Greens policies voting Green because they want to send a message, you know. Uh, but when you get into an election which is genuinely contested, and, uh, you know, oppositions, the, the proposition that only governments lose elections is wrong. I mean, oppositions lose elections. If they, have, if they are unelectable, they lose. I mean, the Kiwis are great rugby fans, probably the greatest of all, um, and that's where politics is like rugby. Uh, it's relative. So, you know, you can be a pretty crook team, but if the people you play on the weekend are worse than you, you still win. And, uh, I mean, having said that, I mean, Jacinda obviously really won that election. I'm saying her opposition are in disarray. But, you know, if she doesn't deliver with on the economy, ultimately, uh, that's going to be a big vulnerability for her. But you're right, she's got no excuses now because she does have the numbers. Um, I think it's a, a, a but, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm optimistic about New Zealand. I, you know, I actually have always have been very optimistic about New Zealand. I think the, its, its biggest problem, its isolation, has proved to be an asset obviously, in the COVID era, I guess to, to an extent, as ours has. Um, but also, you know, we are in, a, in an era when geography is less relevant than ever, you know, in terms of the economy. I mean, look how, yes, the global economy has been set back, there's no doubt about that, by COVID, and, and you know, there's been enormous economic hardship, particularly in sectors that, you know, like entertainment, hospitality. But it's amazing how much economic growth has continued, notwithstanding there's been very limited personal travel. Well, Martin Turnbull, thank you so much. It's been a fascinating discussion. Well, thank you, and um, congratulations on your quarterly essay. There it is. Good, good to have an argument about a few things along the way. Yeah, good. <laughs> and uh, yes, we'll, we'll, we will watch what happens to both countries as they come back from COVID. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Good.